Paul says, for this cause, I go into prayer. I bow, I bend my knees. Father, bless us as we preach this word today. May we do no damage to the word, but preach that which become a sound doctrine and gospel. Anoint us with strength to do just that in Jesus' name. Amen the prayer. By the way of foundation, the church at Ephesus, 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 the land of the Ephesians, was in Asia Minor. Uh, Ephesus was, uh, um, or Asia, should I say, was Gentile. Very few, if any, Jews lived there. And the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians, were Gentiles. So when Paul wrote this letter, he was writing to a Gentile church. And there were certain things that he wanted them to know. Now, what is interesting about this is that there, there, are, there is debate amongst some in the theological community uh, as to the intent of the letter, as to whether or not it was intended to be written to the saints or the Gentiles at Ephesus only or whether Paul had intended that this letter be read and uh, received uh, throughout the Gentile world. I personally believe that both uh, arguments have credibility because in verse 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints that are at Ephesus. Some argue that the, the, the phrase to the saints that are at Ephesus is not in some manuscripts. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I know it's in the Bible. So uh, I do believe that he was writing to the saints uh, at the church at Ephesus. However, I do believe also that this uh, letter was written in a style to be re received of all Gentiles because it lacked the personal salutations that all of Paul's epistles possess when he wrote to a particular church. He would always uh, call certain names of certain persons who were in that church that he wrote to. And he would always close with the brethren greeting them and the, the personal salutations. Well, the book of Ephesians have no such salutations as he closed the book. Also, I think that what one of the things that was in Paul's mind when he wrote the book is that he knew that the church at Ephesus was the mother church. It was the largest of the churches in Asia Minor uh, and so that that church would be the chief distributor of the letter. So knowing that they would be the chief distributor, he wrote in a style where when other Gentiles received or heard this letter, this epistle, that they would readily receive the things that he had to say to them. Because the things that he wanted them to know were very, very, very important. Um, God had a plan with, with the human race. And uh, 
I'm going to talk to you about that and show you how he revealed his plan and how he actually kept the revelation from many and revealed it to Paul and gave it to people. And the plan that God has, it, it affects us because the truth is, as I look at this congregation, um, this is a congregation, at least on appearance, is a congregation filled with Gentiles. Gentiles, by definitions, are non-Jewish people. In the eyes of God, there are two races, there are two people in the world, the Jews and the Gentiles. There are the Jews, and then there's everybody else. Amen. And so uh, uh, we're all Gentiles. Praise the Lord. So what, what he had to say in this letter certainly is important to us. And you're going to see that the things that he had to say in this letter, if you're going to maintain a, a biblical worldview, you can't maintain a biblical worldview and uh, buy into a critical race theory. See, now, if you want to maintain a biblical worldview, you can't, you can't maintain a biblical worldview and believe that you have some kind of super esoteric powers based on your complexion. We can't maintain a biblical worldview if we do exactly what white people did for a long time with this truth. You know, uh, the Southern Baptists a few years ago had to apologize because blacks couldn't be Southern Baptists. Um, the United Methodist Church started by Richard Allen was started because blacks were not allowed to sit on the main floor in the sanctuary. So we... The, the, the blacks built their churches out of necessity. And we, 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 we preached against and we saw over the years where even from pulpits and even in writings, I have a, one of the older copies of the Dykes Bible, Dykes Bible, D-A-K-E-S. And in the footnote in that Bible, um, uh, and, and, and the family apologized to it, but I'm, I'm, I'm making a point. They, they actually uh, were, were some of the chief promoters of the idea that when God, when Noah cursed Ham, then Ham turned black. And that's where black people come from and the blackness comes from because we were cursed. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And they had to apologize for that. And could you imagine uh, uh, what it's like going through life uh, thinking that your complexion is the result of God getting mad and, and pronouncing a curse. And yet this was promoted from the church. And it seems to me now we've come full circle and we're, we're doing the same thing. I was somewhere not long ago and I heard someone utter a phrase that uh, uh, I, I just vehemently abhor. And that, that phrase, uh, it sounds benign, but it is quite harmful, uh, uh, black girl magic. And you know, you've got, you got our little girls running around saying they got black girl magic. Well, you're not a witch, little black girl. <laughs> Number one. Number one. See, witches do magic. Praise the Lord. And uh, uh, and then you don't want to fool her and make her think that she's got some kind of, uh, some kind of superpower. Go ahead and do your homework. Amen. Learn how, uh, learn your lessons. Learn how the game is played. Apply yourself. Work hard. Praise the Lord. Ain't no magic in that. But you want, you don't want magic anyway. You want favor. Favor from God. Divine favor takes you much further than magic ever will. Moses proved that his serpent destroyed the serpents of Pharaoh's magicians. 
See, you know, why settle with a lower power when you can have the power of God? Power of God's favor. Amen? Paul said this in chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, uh, I'm going to be a little didactic today and just let the Bible preach. Is that all right? He says, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, He calls himself the prisoner because at the time of the writing of this letter, he was in prison. He said, I, Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He says, I'm locked up on your behalf. King James says, if or better since you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God of God, which is given me to you, Lord. He says, I I am the Lord's prisoner on your behalf, and I know that you have heard of the dispensation, that is, the uh, uh, administration of God's grace, or better, the uh, implementation of God's divine strategy that he gave me Gentiles for you. He says, God, and, and the things that Paul was preaching to them, no one had ever preached this to them before. God gave him something specifically for the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter number 9 and verse 15 and 16, the apostles, uh, God was talking to Ananias who was the man that the Lord used to, uh, uh, to lay hands on Paul and, to, and Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost and uh, called Saul at the time and scale fell from his eyes. God said, said, said this to Ananias, but the Lord said unto him, go, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He's going to preach for me before Gentiles, before powerful political leaders, as well as before Jews. And then God says this, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Isn't it amazing today that the only thing that we want to see God show us that we're going to do for his name's sake is receive things. But I'll tell you something, saints. This is still a suffering way. And as we get nearer to the coming of our Lord, the world is going to turn uh, even more against the church. And when you find yourself suffering for Christ, don't be discouraged. That puts you in good company. You're in the company of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and others. So the Lord says, "I I chose him. I chose him to be a vessel to Uh, unto me to preach to the Gentiles. I'm going to uh, let him preach to leaders, political leaders, kings, and to the people of God, the Jews. Paul says back in chapter three now, follow me, in verse three he says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Uh, just, Just a little note here. When you see the word mystery in the New Testament, the mystery is the unveiled or revealed secret. Something that was at one time uh, was not known and now it is made known. Paul says, he made known unto me the mystery. And uh, the, 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 the previously unveiled truth that God, this is the mystery, that that God, Uh, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of Christ by the same gospel. Again, the mystery was uh, that, that he revealed to him was that the Gentiles, this is God's unveiled truth that he gave Paul, should be fellow heirs of the same body that Gentiles could be in the body of Christ and partakers of Christ 
through the same gospel. Now, this is amazing. It's not as amazing for us because we know this and this is what we live. But it was not always that way. You remember, it was not always this way. You remember that, uh, uh, you know, of course, it started with Adam and Eve. Men multiplied on the face of the earth. And as men multiplied on the face of the earth and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, the multiplication of men and, and uh, the fallen angels and, and the things that took place in Genesis chapter number six and the flood that transpired after the flood, uh, there was uh, Genesis chapter number 11 where God separated people on, not on basis of race, but God separated people on basis of language. They were building a tower to, uh, to Babel, the Tower of Babel, and they built, they fenced themselves in. Man came up with their own plan, and the plan was contrary to God because God wanted the whole earth replenished. It wasn't the will of God that men would centralize in Babel. It was the will of God that men would replenish the whole earth. But man went against God's overall plan. And what the Lord did was, instead of killing uh, us and, and just wiping out the human race after he had restored the race after the flood of Noah, God sent an angel down and one worker said to another, uh, uh, hand me those nails. But what came out was Mandarin. Another worker responded and said, I want a shovel. But what came out of his mouth was English. And someone else tried to talk and another language came out. And so uh, after a while, they couldn't communicate. And you know what happened? They dispersed. And after the human race begins to do what God's plan was in the first place, for it to replenish the earth, for it to be dispersed and not decentralized, God goes to the, what is called the cradle of civilization, and I know it was the cradle of, uh, of idolatry. God goes to Mesopotamia where Iran and Iraq is in that area today. He goes there and he finds a young heathen by the name of Abram. And he was serving a false god. And the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, appeared to Abram. And when God appeared to Abram, the appearance of God was so powerful that Abram realized that these moon gods and all these other false gods that, that, that he'd been serving, he realized that that was not the true and living God. In fact, history teaches that Abram was maybe four or five when the Lord appeared to him. And it made such an impression on his life that he knew that when he got old enough that he had to leave there. Chapter 12 of Genesis and verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy, thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now what we're not told is when the Lord told him. We just know that God told him. And when he got old enough, the Bible says uh, he, he left. But notice this. Look at what God says concerning his plan for the human race. Verse 2 says, and I will make of thee a great nation. Abram, I'm going to make you a great nation. This is, he's the father of the Jewish race. He says, and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall, what's the next word? All families of the earth be blessed. So we see even back then, it was God's plan to bless everybody. To have all of the races and all of the people on equal footing. 
So he says, I want to use you. I want to use the Jews to be my covenant people. I want to use you to get my word out so that others will get saved and will serve me. As you know, uh, the Jews, they did all right, but they, they didn't do a good job being the evangelists that they should have been. And, uh, but we don't want to judge them too harshly because Romans chapter number 11 lets us know that the plan that God originally had to, to, do, to use the Jewish race, uh, Romans 11 teaches us that God have not cast off his people and what the Lord planned to do with them, God's going to do it. We find them in the book of Revelations. They, may, they will make up the 144,000 evangelists who will preach the word of God. And God's going to use them during the tribulation. So the plan of God, the plan of God cannot be thwarted. Uh, what the Lord says he's going to do, God is going to do. The reason I'm showing you this, I want you to know that the Lord saving Gentiles and bringing us in and giving us equal footing uh, to the Jews was not an afterthought. But I just showed you that it was part of God's original plan. From day one, he wanted us to know him just like his covenant people knew him. And again, the division in people was not based on race. Man did that. Oh my, are you praying for me? Paul says in verse three, how, uh, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Would you put your finger on the word mystery? And I'm going to ask you to do something and we'll backtrack and fill it in. Uh, I want to read verse 3 again up to the word mystery and then skip to verse 5 so that we can complete his thought. And we'll go back and talk about what he said parenthetically. He says in verse 3, how that by revelation he had made known unto me the mystery, verse 5, which in other ages not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You remember in the Old Testament, now God did, uh, I'll use this word, God did save, if you will, Gentiles. People who were not Jews did come to know the Lord, but they had to become proselytes. And to become a proselyte basically means you've got to Give up your culture, give up your own way of life, give up who you are, and take on the Jewish culture. You have to eat kosher foods. You had to do things that the Jews did, and these were things that were not natural to Gentiles. Let me say this about the human race. People are basically the same, and people are basically different. Some people are naturally demonstrative. Some people are naturally loud. Some people are naturally emotional. Others are naturally stoic, and quiet. Amen. In the black church, we're going to shout. But white folk may just sit there. People are the same, but people are different. The thing that distinguished Christianity from Judaism is that to become a Christian, you don't have to give up your culture or who you, who you were born to be uh, and to, to know Jesus Christ. I don't have to become a rabbi to know the Lord. I'm a saved African-American male, and when the Lord saved me, he, he, told, he didn't tell me I had to give that up in order to save, to serve the Lord. The Hispanic doesn't have to give that up to know Jesus Christ. The white man doesn't have to give his identity up to know the Lord. He says, and all of you can maintain your identity. You can be the way I want you, and all of you can and will be equally saved. That's a wonderful thing. That, just that 
thing alone is why the Judaizers gave Paul such a hard time. Because the Judaizers followed him and everywhere he went and preached and preached out of church, the Judaizers would follow him and say, all you grown men, all you grown Gentile men who are saved, let me see you raise, raise your hand. The men would raise their hand. And then the Judaizers would say, well, you're not quite saved yet. They say, why? Because you hadn't been circumcised. Can you imagine how that chilled the church? Killed the joy? Amen. Made men backslide. They said, you got to do what to me? And, uh, but that wasn't a part of their culture. See, so, so Paul is bringing a revolutionary message to the people. He said parenthetically in verse 3, as I wrote aforetime in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of God. He says, I wrote uh, before to you about this, but it was a small letter, and I'm going in more detail now. Are you following me? Verse six says that the, here's, here's the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This was life changing. Look at this, that the Gentiles should be co-heirs, which means that all believers in Christ are co-inheritors of God's kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? That, that you know, there won't be a, a, a heaven for Jews and a heaven for black folk and a heaven for white folk but that all of God's people will be, will be in heaven together. And then before we get to heaven, that all of God's people are on equal footing down here on this earth. See, I'm, you're just as saved as I am, and I am as saved as you. It was never God's will that churches divide salvation based on race. It was never the will of God. Never the will of God that, that, there, that there be whole denominations that have in their uh, bylaws or if it's not written, it's implied that people of other races cannot come. The black church, especially in the South, the black church is mostly black by, because we have no choice. I have many white friends who say to me, can I come to your service? I always think that's a strange question to ask because it never crossed my mind to ask somebody, can I come? But I know where that question comes from because uh, it was in that community where uh, initially during our lifetime in America where we were not allowed to come. See, but with us, we never built a church and said, well, I don't want, I don't want white people to come. I don't want Hispanic people to come. We want people. We want, we want to reach souls for Christ. The soul winner wants to win souls. At the abortion clinic, when the warriors are down there fighting and love life are down there fighting, they don't look to see what the color is of the woman who is going in there to have an abortion. They fight to save the babies. They fight to save the babies. I wish we would try to color code our attack. And, and, and that kind of a thing, that would mean that we got to stop because we need to be saved ourselves. Jesus Christ is for every man. And, and, uh, and, and, and it's real, it's, it's bad what men have done with Christianity. How we've allowed the devil to use us to carve up this thing. And you know, with the critical race and all these other things that's going on now, we're beginning to do what we uh, loathed that the majority, we loathed, we hated it when the majority community did it to us. We were the ones who were saying that Jesus saves everybody, Jesus loves everybody, Jesus is for everybody when they were trying to tell us that somehow or another, they're on a higher level. Now we're doing the same thing. And the truth is, my friends, this is not the will of God. You got to love 
Everybody. Oh, I didn't get a good amen on that one. Oh, my. And let me tell you something. Revenge and payback is not a part of the Christian doctrine. Well, they did it to me. I'm going to do it to them. That's the, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, render not evil for evil. Right. Bible says, render not railing for railing. In fact, the Bible says, when you are cursed, the Bible says, do contrary wise, says bless. Right. Well, you, they told me off, I'm going to tell them off. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible says, contrary wise, bless, knowing that you are called to be a blessing. Yeah. Isn't that something? You don't, you don't ever want to become that which you loathe. Some of you have allowed things, you've allowed resentment and hatred and unforgiveness to make you in to the very loved one, family member, auntie, mama, daddy, Praise the Lord, boss man, racist person. You become just like them. Now you hold grudges. Now you won't forgive. Now you are angry. It is not the will of God that we allow the devil to do this. Don't you let Satan make you into some monster. Some things, you have to ask God to give you the anointing to let go. A friend of mine, his name was Clarence McClendon, Superintendent Clarence McClendon from Louisiana. Clarence is in heaven now. One of his famous sayings all the time was, man, let that go. Let that go. And he's in heaven now. But I hear his voice often because you can't walk around holding stuff. You, you mad with your daddy and your daddy's dead. Now, maybe it's true that he wasn't there. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's true that the people whom you are, are upset with did everything that you are upset with them for. Still, you're supposed to forgive them. Yeah, they did it, but, but, but you can't hold that. You can't do it. You become someone else. You become something else. It stymies you. I'm mad at my daddy because he was not there. Well, mine wasn't there. But you know what I key on? I key on what he did do. I, cho I, I, cho I choose to take the good and put that on the front of my mind. And instead of walking around holding grudges and, and all of a sudden, woe is me when there's this big old world. And we have an opportunity, praise the Lord, to overcome, to come out of. I'm preaching better than you are saying Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to show you something. Paul says here, I want to show you something. Paul says in verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me. Look at this, by the effectual working. Effectual working literally means, effectual working literally means the active energy. Paul was an energetic worker for Christ. You know, uh, we need some effectual workings. Because I, I never seen so many uh, lackadaisical uh, saints. And uh, we're too laid back, praise the Lord, for my taste. Sometimes our songs are too sad and they're too long. you got to keep that joy. The Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then when it comes down to doing the Lord's work, the Bible says the king business requires haste. You got to let God give you some energy. Let God give you power to, to, to give you your get up and go back. You didn't know that, did you? God gives believers energy. Nothing zaps your energy like gossip, unforgiveness, hatred, carrying stuff. Oh, that stuff gets so heavy. Oh, my God. No wonder you can't shout. Your legs are heavy. No wonder you can't lift your arms, your hands. Your hands are heavy. They're weighed down with gossip, weighed down with unforgiveness. Some people, God bless you, Mr. Amachuku, some people are angry today about something that happened 40 years ago like it happened yesterday. That, that is not the will of God. God for your life. 
Paul said, he's given me energy. Praise the Lord. He's given me power. I can preach and carry on. Praise the Lord. And, and that, that was something in him. You have to admit it. You have to admit it. Uh, we, we read in the scripture uh, about at least three of his missionary journeys. Uh, he had more than three. He couldn't stay put for long. It was in him. It was in him. He, he, that was something in him. Jeremiah had it. Jeremiah said, uh, then said I, I will not prophesy. God bless you, Pastor Tyson. I will not prophesy anymore in his name. I got my feelings hurt. I preached for God and I ended up in jail. Jeremiah said, I'm not saying anything else. But then he discovered, said, his word is in my heart. Like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I heard him say, I got weary with forbearing and he could not stay. God put something in the believer where I used to hear the mothers saying something deep down inside of me. Mama, you know you taught us that. Keeps telling me to go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. God gives you energy. Praise God. Praise God. You know, and uh, when it go to rolling, you ought to go with it. The Lord began to energize. Go with it. Don't fight it. And, uh, and if you, if you and don't hang around nobody. Don't hang around nobody who fights the power. They are down, they want to keep you down. They are depressed, they want to keep you depressed. They are miserable, they want to keep you miserable. Life is sharp. And the assignment that God has given you is an assignment that is time conscious. Let, let me show you something here. He said, he said, uh, uh, verse 8, I'm headed somewhere. He said unto me, whom am least than the less, I am the least than the, I am less, excuse me, than the least of all saints. And uh, is this grace given to me that I should preach among the Gentiles, the incalculable, uh, uh, unsearchable riches of Christ. And look at this. And to make known, look at the emphasis here, to all men, not just to the Jews, but all men. See, the emphasis here is everybody. Somebody shout everybody. Uh, that means you and you and you. To make known to all men, to, uh, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. All saints. This is why we got to fight this stuff. See, the things that I've talked about, this unforgiveness, 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 uh, destroys fellowship. Fellowship. Now maybe somebody in the church hurt your, hurt your feelings. Maybe someone did you wrong. It happens. People are fallible. And you know what? You are too. And ain't there, there ain't no one in here who haven't failed somebody. Well, so-and-so get on my nerve. Everybody in here gets on somebody's nerve. All of us are professional nerve get owners. You just think you're that wonderful. But there, but there are folks who can't hardly take you either. We're all works in progress. Well, what, what, what's my point? When someone disappoints you, you don't hold that. You don't walk in disappointment, we, uh, walk in unforgiveness, we won't let it go, keep bringing it up. What if God did you that way? What if God decided, as a matter of fact, what you don't know, you better thank God for me, what you don't know is he's doing you that way because the Lord forgives us as we forgive those. I'm not going to ever let it go. Well, God ain't going to ever let it go. And the person you're mad at, if they've repented, you know what? God's let it go with them. And he didn't fill them with the Holy Ghost and they're going on living their life and you sitting over there mad. Wife, you ought to forgive your husband. Husband, forgive your wife. Parents, forgive your children. Children, forgive your parents. And then church folk forgive church folk so we can come in here and have church. 
let's, let's break all this. I'm, I'm going to stay on my side of the church. You stay on your side. No, 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 no. You can't live like that. We've let these worldly terms come in. Well, I don't bother so and so. I just can't take them. And that's just me. That's just the way I am. You can't settle with that. You got to ask God to touch you. And ask the Lord, Lord, you got to touch me because that will cause you to be lost. And it breaks the fellowship. And the church has to have fellowship. This fellowship which was from the beginning of the world, have been hid in God who created all things by Christ Jesus. It was the will of God that we have a powerful fellowship because whether you know it or not, the world is coming after us and we are going to need each other. I'm prophesying right now. We're going to need each other as never before. Now, let me say something to you. Whether you like uh, President Trump or not, that's not my point. But listen, when, when, when they deplatformed him, when they decided that social media would shut him down, if they can deplatform a sitting U.S. president, what do you think they can do to the church? If they can decide that they don't want you heard, what do you think they can do to the church? And many preachers now are self-censoring themselves for fear that they might be canceled on social media and we are, we're not preaching with the same vigor. We're not standing against sin with the same might. We're not preaching with the same power because we're afraid that we may be shut down. We need we need each other. We need to pray for one another. We need fellowship. Oh! Yes, sir. You may think you don't need me. You, some folk turned in the Bible for the CDC. They turned in Christ for Fauci. But let me tell you something. You're going to need the preacher. You're going to need the preacher. You're going to need the church. This is why, this is why, mother, it was unconscionable to me that they would shut the church down. It was unconscionable. And you know, I understand. I understand. Because see, Paul had to understand. There were some mysteries he knew that people didn't know. And people would say, what's with wooden? I don't get it. And that was the point. They didn't get it. But I got it because I know that the church is central to God in history. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all men. Paul said that you may know how to behave yourself in the church of God, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. But let me tell you something. There's something about the house of God. That's why the devil attacked the church and look at what happened in America. Uh, uh, suicide shot up. Uh, uh, depression shot up. Marriages fell apart. All kinds of things happened when they put God's house on the non-essential list because God's house is not non-essential. But for those of us who are in the house, we got to pray for each other. Are you praying for me? I heard him say, look at this, look at this. He says, to, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heaven. Paul said, uh, even to the intent that even the ruling authorities in heaven, look at this, might be made known by the church. He didn't say might be made known by the NFL, the NBA, or any of these other entities. He said, but that it might be made known by the church. Oh Lord, the church, the church, but it's got to be, the church has got to have fellowship. The church has got to respect each other's salvation. The church got to forgive each other. Got to know how to pray for one another. Got to know that the day will come when you may pick up the phone and call your fellow member and say, I need you to pray with me. And then it may get worse. You may have to call them and say, I need you to pray for me. So you 
just never know what happens in this life. And he said, look at the agent that God used to get the word out that it might be known by the church. He wants the principalities and the powers to be known by the church. Look at this, known, know by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God shoots uh, uh, the critical race theory to, into pieces. It blows it up. It blows up the doctrine of the Nazis and the doctrine of the Klan. It blows up race, race, uh, uh, white supremacy and the supremacy of races because the manifold wisdom of God, the word manifold literally means multicolored. It means multifaceted. Other words is to understand that God is the father of the Jews and the Gentiles, the slaves and the free, the male and the female, and that he saves them all. When you realize how good God is, you find out that you can't have these prejudices. You can't have these biases because Jesus died for everyone according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. When Jesus hung on the cross, he had us all in mind in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him that is in Christ. The church is the divine agent of the divine fellowship with a divine mandate. The church is central to the work of God in history. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know that the church is important, that the house of God is important. He says, wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation. You see, Paul said, I know that you all know what I've been through. In Acts chapter 19, they tried to kill me. And in Acts chapter 20, I couldn't go back to Ephesus. So I had to send to Miletus, from Miletus, to ask the elders in Ephesus to come and meet me in Miletus. Because if I went back to Ephesus, they would try to kill me. Why did they try to kill him in Ephesus? Because Paul preached in Acts chapter 19, there are no gods made with men's hands. And you remember Demetrius, he was making those little Diana statues and people were buying those Diana statues. But when Paul preached Jesus, they stopped buying the statues of Diana. That's why the world gets so mad with the church. The drug dealer don't like us because we steal his business. The, the junkie gets saved. Hallelujah. Some of his soldiers, they, they get saved and they stop selling drugs on the corner. And so the drug man gets mad with the preacher. Sometimes the secular psychiatrists, they get mad with the preacher because the preacher will counsel free of charge. And you tell the person on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And after a while, they're not depressed anymore because Jesus know how to come in and set you free. The ABC store gets mad with the preacher because when we get through, the, 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 the alcoholic loses his appetite for alcohol. Let me tell you, there is something about the power of the gospel. It will change you. Good God Almighty, it will set you free. Paul said, we are the agent. We're the ones that God is using. So he said to the Gentiles in Ephesus, I want you to know, let's go home, brother preacher. I want you to know that you are saved just like the Jews are, that you got it just like everyone else. And he said, in my closing, Paul said, I bend my knees and I pray for you. I pray that it be granted unto you the, the, according to the riches of his glory. 
to be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. He prayed, but God may would make him strong. If you're here today and you wanna get stronger, I'm, I'm about to pray in just a moment that God would make you stronger. But if you want more strength, let me see you wave your hand. If you wanna be stronger, and I'm talking about stronger, not just on the outside, but stronger on the inside. Stronger in the inner man. Stronger, good God Almighty. When you got it on the inside, God gives you a drive that the devil can't stop. He gives you power to just keep on going. You're better than the Energizer Bunny because the Holy Ghost is your battery and the Holy Ghost never runs out of power. He never runs out of juice. Say it! Say it! strength. Somebody ought to shout give me strength. Strengthen me on the inside. Strengthen me on the inside. And not only that, but do it with the Holy Ghost. Do it with your spirit. Do it with your power. Somebody shout to him. Somebody shout to him. Woo! See, he prayed, he prayed for the strength that's in them. And then he prayed in verse 17, that they be rooted and grounded. Now strength in you. But when you talk about rooting, being rooted and grounded, that's not what's in you, but that's what you're in. I'm glad that I'm in the body of Christ. I'm glad that I'm in the church. I'm glad that I'm in the sanctified church. I ain't trying to get rooted and grounded in anything else. I'm not trying to get away. I'm not trying to go back into the world, but this is it for me. I'm rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Lord. Do I have anybody here that said my soul is on fire and I'm rooted and grounded in the Lord? Good God Almighty. You ought to tell somebody, this is who I am. This is who I am. I'm in this for life. Rooted, grounded. I'm not trying to get away. Say yeah. Uh, I've got to close. I've got to close here. But there's another one. That rooted and grounded. Strengthened. And then he said that you may be able to grasp. He says, I want you Gentiles to know the width, the breadth. Hallelujah. I want you to be able to comprehend with all saints and know the breadth. Other words, know that this thing that God did in Jesus is so wide that it covers the whole wide world. It's too wide to contain it in a synagogue. It's too wide to contain it in one area. Jesus will save you wherever you may be. Ah, the other day, I feel like preaching. Ah, the other day, oh, the other day, oh Lord, we were riding and we came up on a man laying in the trail, on the trail, lifeless, wasn't moving. God Almighty, I don't know what happened to him. 
there he lay. We stopped. We're not in the church. We don't have on our class A, class B, choir dress, no civic wear. We didn't have a collar on, didn't have my cross. We were riding, but you know what we had? We had Jesus on the inside. While that man was laying there, looked like he was dead. We pulled up, I got witnesses here, and we lifted our hands and began to pray. The white gentleman, a white lady was there. She said, where are those who called on the name of Jesus? I said, here we are. She said, come on, let's pray. We begin to call on the name of Jesus. Ah, oh, Jesus. Somebody help me call him. Let me tell you what the Lord did as soon as we finished calling our Savior's name. You know what happened. You know what happened. That man began to move. That man came back. That man set up. And then we said, our work is done. Let's ride on in Jesus' name. Somebody say, ride on, King Jesus. Ride on, King Jesus. Say yeah. Ah, yeah. You ought to wave both your hands. Woo. Ah, oh, Lord. And uh, let me just say this. Thank you, Jesus. Let me just say this here. And uh, he said, I want you to be able to know how wide it is. And I, I want you to know the length of it. It's so long, it's so wide that it covers the world. But it's so long that it goes from eternity to eternity. From now on, uh, when time shall be no more. Jesus will still be Lord. He will still be shining brighter than the sun and we'll still be with him. Good God Almighty, longer the length of it and lasts forever. And I'm glad about this one. I love them all. But this one right here uh, resonates to me. Praise the Lord. Kind of good, well, all of them do, but what did this right here? Said the depth of reading where a writer said, no matter how low you were, no matter how deprived, depraved you were, no matter how much sin you were in, you couldn't be too low for Jesus to reach down and to pick you up and to pull you out. How many can say, I was way down caught up in sin but ah oh, the Lord the Lord reached down and grabbed me by the hand somebody ought to praise him glory to God Somebody said I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peace for sure. But there are other folk who would say, they wouldn't say they were sinking. They would say they were sunk. Or at the bottom, but the depth of the love of God. He reached out, he was feeling for you. Reach down. Woo!
God ought to praise God for week 60. Thank the Lord. Brought me out. Brought me out.
knowledge that is to know that which is essentially unknowable <laughs> you got that to know the unknowable Jesus loves us more Jesus loves us more than the Bible tells us for there is no language that can express the love of God Jesus loves us more than Christianity teaches because it is a love that passeth all understanding. Hallelujah. He just loves us. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. How patient he is with us. Glory to God. What a mighty God. He's so good. And then Paul breaks out in a doxology. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask a thing according to the power that is in operation in us. So you don't have to pray for that power. You have the power. The power. If you're saved, and notice, notice, we see in the text, we see the Trinity. Strengthened by the Spirit in the inner man, it's the Holy Ghost. Rooted and grounded in Christ's love, that's Jesus. And then the last one right here, he says, there's a, a knowledge that's a, a, that, and to know the love of God, which a passive knowledge and the fullness, now here's the Father, of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What is the fullness of God? The fullness of God, the fullness of God, that's a technical term, the fullness of God is the Trinity. It is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. To have the full, to know the fullness of God. Strength in you. Rooted and grounded what you're in. Fullness of God, nothing lacking. You have what you need to go through whatever life sends your way. Nothing lacking. Would you thank the Lord for his provision? Thank you, Jesus. I want to do what Paul did today. I want to pray for you. I want to pray this prayer. The prayer. Since we're all Gentiles, <laughs> it's certainly applicable to us. Am I right? If you want this prayer prayed over you, stand. Our friends who are streaming, if you're where you can stand, stand. If you're not where you can, just lift your hand. If you're not where you can do that, just uh, concentrate and zero in as much as possible. I want you to know that everyone in the sanctuary is standing. God is blessing people. You know, people coming back to church, 
you all rival the eight o'clock. I said you rival. God is good. I love you. And what made me think about it is they were standing too for the same prayer. Father, Father, and some of the most effective prayers I've ever prayed, I didn't pray loud, but God heard me. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray right now for us. God, Paul, when he prayed for the Gentiles, he prayed for them because he was a Jew. Father, I am a Gentile, but I'm in Christ, <laughs> and we're in you. And Lord, the church is not the synagogue now, not the temple of Solomon, which no longer exists. Will again, but not now. But the church is your agent for this message. I pray that preachers preach it, that we not divide ourselves, let the enemy come in with this so-called liberation theology and have us where we, we have come up with a new brand of salvation that only works for people who look like us. We had a word for that, Lord. It was called the KKK. And Father, we don't want to be like them. If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. Hallelujah. And it was wrong then. So Father, we thank you that you have removed the middle wall of petition that was in the temple that stated that no Gentile can go beyond these barriers. And if they were caught beyond these barriers in the temple, they could be put to death. Now that, Lord, was in the house of God. Lord, I thank you that there's no middle wall of petition in here, that you removed it. And Father, I pray right now that you let the spirit of forgiveness, wife, forgive your husband. Husband, forgive your wife. Mama, forgive those children. Children, forgive your parents. Dad, forgive your children. Children, forgive your father. Saints, forgive saints we need each other we want the atmosphere to be right some of you are destroying your home you're destroying your job you're destroying your children you're destroying your spouse you, you're petty give that up give that up give that up it ain't, it ain't worth the grudge then once that thing have taken everything you got and got you out there in the cold then you realize what a fool you've been. God said, let it go right now. In the name of Jesus, let that go. Say, but I, but I got a point. That's the point. That is the point. You really do have a point. Let it go. So well, I have an argument. You really do. I'm right. You really are. Let it go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because that which God can hold against us, he's right too. He's got a point. And we want him to let it go. Father, I'm trying to pray. Father, I pray that you strengthen every believer in the inner man. In the inner man. That we be strengthened with might. Strengthened with force. Strengthened with capability. Strengthened with ability. In the inner man in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would root us and ground us in this. Uh, we don't want to have one foot in the world, one foot in the world and a foot in the church. Oh God, but this is our life. This is what we in. We're in, we give it all, we give it all up. We give up the world, we're in this and we seek to go deeper in the name of Jesus.
We seek to go deeper. And then, Father, fill us again. Oh, oh, God, with the fullness of God. With the fullness of God. Oh, our friends who are streaming, I'm praying for you. Let God fill you with his fullness. Let him touch you right now. God the Holy Spirit is right where you are. God the Father is right where you are. He's here in the sanctuary and he's where you are in the name of Jesus. And it is so. And it is so for your glory and for your honor. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that actualizes it in her, in us, in us, in us, in Jesus' name. Now listen to me. I, I got to, I'm, I'm going to say amen for the prayer in a minute. But you know, the Lord had me, I preach a while, I pray a while, and all, just ministering. The us. Now, we always take this passage, and I'm not, mother, I'm not disputing it, but we, we take the passage, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And we apply us to each of us individually. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's no truth to that, but I am saying that's not what Paul was saying. The us he was referencing was the church. The church. Hence, now, he's blessed, he's going to bless individuals. But you see, now you see how important it is to have good fellowship. See, because there ain't, ain't no exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think, and we're fighting each other. Ain't, ain't exceeding nothing. Abundant nothing. If we're cutting each other's throat, undercutting each other, praise the Lord. If, if we are supplanting each other, there's no exceeding and abundant. No, it's, it, the, the context, the whole context of this is he's praying for the Gentile church, the Ephesian church in general, and all of the Gentiles, uh, the Ephesian church in particular, and all the Gentiles in general. So we, we, we grab hold to it. But you need to understand, to get that exceeding and abundantly, tell your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. to get your exceeding neighbor. and abundantly neighbor. power you got to be right, to be right. With, me. with me. And I got to be right, to be right. With, you. with you. It's the church. It's the church. It's the church. It has to be unity. It has to be fellowship. It's the church. And if we do it, God will bless us. Would you clap your hands for Jesus? And look at this. To prove I'm telling you the truth, verse 21 says, and unto him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus, and not just that church, but he says throughout all ages. That's why they shouldn't have shut, shut the church down. The glory is in the church. Throughout all ages and world without end, which is a wonderful way of just saying always. world without end always amen 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 clap your hands for the